Welcome everyone. We're just going to give everyone a moment to come into the webinar room. Um, again, we've got a very well subscribed webinar today. We've got nearly 400 people registered at the last count. So uh, it might take a little moment for everyone to come in. So um, in the meantime, I'll just uh, do some housekeeping. Um, the chat box will be monitored by myself. So please do put in any questions. Um, in the chat box, I'll be monitoring them and relaying some of them to Ardi once we um, once he finishes giving his talk. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can or as many of the topics as we can. But as you know, time is limited and you are always also active and um, forthcoming with your questions, which is great. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll also be posting some links to Ardi's um, recent publications. Uh, so you can check them out when you have time. And also I'll be posting some links to our exciting upcoming events. We've got already a few of them booked for uh, 2021. And um, so I'll, I'll post links about those and um, where you can uh, register for them. Um, they will be roughly monthly for the foreseeable future. We've got Arabella Dorman, who's an acclaimed war artist who's traveled extensively in Israel and Palestine, as well as the rest of the Middle East. Um, so she will be giving an amazing talk with loads of visuals, loads of her artwork on the audacity of hope, the impact of war on civilians that she's met and she's talked to. Um, and we will also have uh, Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, who will be talking about Christian Zionism. So I'll pop the dates and the links uh, to those in the chat box. Um, so for now, I would like to welcome RD. He is, um, as you all know, a professor at Queen's University in uh, Canada, as opposed to UK. And um, he's a professor of law. And I will um, pass, him over to, I'll pass over to him. And he's going to talk to you about recognizing the state of Palestine. Over to you, Raghi. Thank you very much, Deanna. Um, no, I'd, like, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank the Balfour Project, you, uh, Sir Vincent Fien, and others for arranging today's ch chat. Um, I've been requested to address the issue of why now is the time for the United Kingdom to recognize the state of Palestine. My remarks will be divided into three parts. First, I will briefly recount the prevailing political situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Regrettably, this situation is incoherent, in my view, insofar as the international community erroneously pins the emergence of a free and independent Palestine on negotiation, even as there exists no possibility of a good faith negotiated settlement consistent with international law on the horizon. Second, I will outline why the state of Palestine now qualifies as a state under international law. The juridical status of Palestine as a state is a subject that has been met with controversy and disagreement in a variety of quarters, but one that doesn't vitiate uh, the fact that it is now an objective legal reality that must be reckoned with. And third, I will demonstrate why recognition of the state of Palestine is more than a symbolic and practical, uh, is, is more than a symbolic act and has practical effects that can help advance a two-state peace at a time in which failure to act decisively will render such a prospect uh, an impossibility. So let me begin by addressing the prevailing situation. There seem to me to be three factors that capture the prevailing situation, all of which mitigate in favor of immediate recognition of the state of Palestine, if indeed the goal of the two-state settlement is to be saved. The first, is that there's presently no Israeli partner with whom to negotiate the end of Palestine's occupation in accordance with international law. Would that this were merely a rhetorical claim of the sort often cruelly directed towards the captive Palestinians, I would be happy to be proved wrong. But based on the public record, however, including as established by the United Nations, the one constant in Israel's 53 year temporary occupation is that it remains committed to a twofold objective, namely the illegal colonization of the OPT on the one hand, coupled with the simultaneous fr frustration of the emergence of a fully sovereign and independent Palestinian state in that territory on the other. Since 1993, and in violation of the Oslo proviso that nothing be done by either party to prejudge final status negotiations, 
the Israeli settler population in the OPT has over trebled, with the Israeli prime minister himself putting the number of settlers at 650,000 nine years ago in 2011. This means that at least 23% of the population of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are today Israeli settlers, a number that is certain to expand exponentially given the settler growth rate in the OPT dwarfs that of the yearly average in Israel. Once believed to, to reside on the political fringe, settlers now include members of every branch of the Israeli government, including the cabinet, the judiciary, including the Supreme Court, the legislature, and of course the military. Indeed, reflective of the rightward shift in populist-led governments the world over, the settler movement is now the most important political bloc in Israeli politics and by some distance. If that weren't enough, some 16 years after being condemned by the International Court of Justice as, quote, contrary to international law and, quote, tantamount to de facto annexation for consolidating the illegal settlements, Israel's wall and an associated regime in the OPT continues to expand with devastating impact on Palestinian geographic, economic, and political space, now fragmented into hundreds of disconnected cantons. Unsurprisingly, after over a half century of openly pursuing its colonization of the OPT, Israel's settlement policy has introduced a system of government that is systematically engaged in racial discrimination, a state of affairs described by the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as a policy of, quote, de facto segregation between settlers and Palestinians in the OPT, which is bolstered by, again, quote, two entirely separate legal systems and the hermetic character of the separation of the two groups concretized by a complex combination of movement restrictions that only impacts the Palestinian population. As noted by none other in authority than Archbishop Desmond Tutu, what we have in occupied Palestine today is a situation of full-fledged apartheid. For the dreamers among us who continue to hope, despite the historical record that Israel seeks a negotiated peace or presently seeks a negotiated uh, peace leading to the establishment of an independent and sovereign Palestinian state alongside it, it bears recalling that Tel Aviv has never formally agreed to the establishment of any such state in the OPT. In return for the PLO recognition of Israel and its right to exist in peace and security in 1993, proceeded again in 1988, Israel has only ever recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. And while recognition of a people perforce implies recognition of its right to self-determination, at best Israel has only ever adopted an emaciated view of the sovereignty it would allow the Palestinians, if at all. This Palestinian state would be deprived of a military, control over its airspace, territorial sea, borders, the Jordan Valley, and territorial contiguity. And that's the positive side of things. Most importantly, the official platform of the ruling Israeli Likud party continues to reject the establishment of a Palestinian state west of the Jordan River, and Israel's current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, was elected in 2009 on a promise to block the establishment of a Palestinian state. This was reflected in a series of 2017 statements by Netanyahu that no settlement will be uprooted in the West Bank, and that Israel will remain in the territory, uh, quote, forever. And of course, these views are shared widely among the Israeli governing elite and have been formally incorporated into the now infamous Trump plan. The second factor that marks the prevailing situation is the near total inability of the Palestinian leadership to offer a defense against the daily abuse of its people, their land, and their rights in material terms. While the Oslo framework provided some hope that a different future might have transpired by now, the failure to conclude good faith final status negotiations in 1999 on the basis of international law, by which is meant a complete Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 lines, a shared Jerusalem, a just resolution of the Palestinian refugee problem and mutual security guarantees, coupled with the prolongation effectively by fiat of what was originally intended to be a five-year interim Palestinian authority have only helped sow the inevitable seeds of internal dissent. 
We have now witnessed over a decade of internecine conflict between Fatah and Hamas, which has created a bitterness at every level of the Palestinian polity. And this will be hard, though perhaps not impossible, to overcome. With the sovereignty of the Palestinian people indelibly interrupted by a bad faith and unencumbered occupying power, enfeebled Palestinian political elites have become consumed with vying for what little scraps have been left them, all the while having to accept their virtually complete subjugation, again in material terms, to the external forces holding them down. The third factor that marks the prevailing situation, in my view, is the glaring inability or unwillingness, un unwillingness of members of the international community to introduce decisive and practical measures necessary for, reset for resetting the conditions for peace between Israel and Palestine consistent with international law. Foremost amongst these is the need for third states to effectively uphold and protect, protect the accepted international law-based terms of reference underpinning the two-state solution. At bottom, these are, one, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory through threat or use of force. Two, the obligation ergo omnes to respect the right of peoples to self-determination. And three, the requirement that human rights, including of refugees, be respected in any agreement fashioned between the parties. To be sure, much lip service has been paid by third states for the need of the parties to respect these international legal parameters, and the UK is among them. But absent a willingness by Israel to actually conform to its obligations under international law, and in view of the inability of the Palestinian side to materially compel that result, it necessarily falls to members of the international community to do more in practical terms. This isn't an unreasonable ask. On the contrary, Doing so would merely require third states to abide by their own independent international legal obligations to respect and to ensure respect for international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Instead, third states, including the UK, uniformly hold that the only way to end the occupation of the OPT and allow for the sovereign and independent state of Palestine to emerge is through bilateral negotiations between the parties. It should be readily apparent to all by now that maintaining what I have called the negotiations condition effectively renders the realization of Palestinian self-determination impossible, given that it would be wholly dependent on the non-existing will of an occupying power operating manifestly in bad faith and publicly vowing to continue to do so without let or hindrance. At any rate, as I've elsewhere argued, because Israel's occupation is illegal, the occupying power is bound to unilaterally end it forthwith and unconditionally in line with the law on state responsibility. In short, the end of the occupation and the emergence of an independent Palestinian state cannot legally be made contingent on negotiation. So the cumulative effect of these three factors means that unless decisive and meaningful action is taken now, the two-state framework for the resolution of the question of Palestine will quite possibly be forever lost. In its place will be reified a permanent apartheid reality in which there is no logical reason, again, judging by the historical record, to presuppose that enough pressure could ever be brought to bear on Israel to alter its course. For the Israelis, under such a scenario, the plea of non-intervention in the internal affairs of state will become an effective rallying cry the conquest of the whole of Mandate Palestine having been finally secured. Thus, the imperative of the immediate recognition of the state of Palestine. I shift now to the, to the second uh, bit of, of today's talk. And, and before I address what practical impact recognition of the state of Palestine can have in helping the parties to arrive at a durable peace in line with international law, it would be useful to outline the preliminary question of why Palestine today qualifies as a state under international law. There are two prevailing theories under international law on whether an entity may qualify for statehood. The constitutive theory holds that a state exists only if it is recognized as such by other states. Palestine is today recognized by 139 states representing a large majority of states in the world for note, there, there are 193 member states in the United Nations. The declarative theory, the other theory, holds that for a state to exist 
four objective criteria must be met as codified in the 1933 Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. The entity must have A, a permanent population, B, a defined territory, C, a government, and D, capacity to enter into relations with other states or foreign relations capacity. Now, because this theory is one that is followed most closely in United Nations admissions practice, one prerequisite of which is that only states may be members of the UN, this practice should serve as the normative standard of relevance in considering whether to recognize Palestine. Most importantly, the Montevideo criteria have historically been interpreted in a liberal, flexible, and permissive manner in UN admissions practice. Thus, in respect of the population criterion, UN admissions practice indicates that there's no minimum or maximum required as demonstrated by the existence of the so-called microstates, such as Monaco or Liechtenstein. Likewise, there's no minimum tenure of homogeneity of the population that is required, uh, as demonstrated by states such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on. And so applying this to Palestine, it's clear that it possesses a permanent population of at least 4.5 million people or more uh, that has been rooted in the land as indigenous people for millennia. Palestine therefore clearly satisfies the population criterion of Montevideo. As for the second uh, criterion, the defined territory criterion, UN admissions practice likewise demonstrates that there's no minimum requirement of the size a territory must be. The previously mentioned microstates are good evidence of this, nor is there a need, need for borders to be precise. The, the best example of this is ironically Israel, whose borders are still not settled, despite itself being a state. The test is so flexibly applied that even competing territorial claims over a territory have been found not to be relevant. Thus, for example, neither Iraq's claims on Kuwait nor Morocco's claims on Mauritania have been enough to vitiate Kuwaiti or Mauritanian statehood. So to quote the International Court of Justice in the North Sea Continental Shelf case, quote, there is no rule that the land frontiers of a state must be fully delimited and defined, and often in various places and for long periods, they are not. And so applying this to Palestine, it's clear that it has sufficiently defined territory as per UN practice on the occupied Palestinian territory. The borders of what is today the OPT were originally set by UN-mediated armistice negotiations in 1949, effectively set. But since 1988 have been accepted within the UN, including uh, by the UK, as delimiting the territorial unit within which the Palestinian people are entitled to exercise their right to self-determination to the exclusion of all others. Although the border still needs to be finalized through some form of peace negotiation, the fact that they are unsettled does not render them insufficiently clear under the Montevideo test. Moving to the third uh, uh, criterion of uh, Montevideo, the government criterion, UN admissions practice demonstrates that this has also traditionally been bound up with notions of effectiveness and independence, although neither have been strictly applied. Thus, for example, the Congo was admitted to the United Nations in 1960 at a time when it was undergoing a conventional civil war and when government was actually split between two warring parties. Likewise, Rwanda and Burundi were both admitted to the UN in 1962 when Belgium, their colonial power, remained in the country post-independence. And finally, each of India, Belarusia, Ukraine, and the Philippines were all founding members, founding member states of the UN, despite being dependent territories in 1945. And so applying this to Palestine, it is of note that its governmental functions have been deemed sufficient for the functioning of a state, according to the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the AHLC. Palestine, at least formally, boasts a constitutional par parliamentary democratic system with executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Its ministries cover education, finance, foreign affairs, health, interior, justice, labor, planning, and social affairs, among other portfolios. Its civil service now numbers in the tens of thousands and includes security and police services. And importantly, split governmental control over the OPT does not mean that there's no effective government sufficient under the Montevideo test, 
All this is to say that while the split between Fatah and Hamas goes to internal domestic legitimacy, certainly, based on UN admissions practice, it isn't enough to vitiate the characterization of Palestine's government as sufficiently effective under Montevideo. In this regard, it is important to refrain from confusing recognition of government, which is one thing, with recognition of a state, quite another thing. Finally, the fact of Israel's occupation impeding in independent government in Palestine is, is not a factor that can be used to, to Palestine's detriment. This is because as an occupying power, Israel has no legitimate international legal claim to sovereignty over any portion of the OPT, ex injuria, use non orator. Illegal acts effectively do not give rise to legal rights. Finally, as for the fourth criterion, the foreign relations criterion, UN admissions practice indicates that this does not have to be exclusively performed by the state in question. Thus, for example, the foreign relations of original member states, Belarus, Belarusia and Ukraine, were effectively controlled by the Soviet Union in 1945. Likewise, Monaco's foreign relations are effectively governed by France and the foreign policies of the Federated States of Micronesia and Marshall Islands are directed by the United States. Applying this to Palestine, it's clear that Palestine is in a much better position. Far from delegating it to others, Palestine's foreign relations have always been conducted by the Palestine Liberation Organization as affirmed by decades of UN practice going back to 1974. Indeed, Although Oslo stated that the Palestinian Authority did not have powers and responsibilities in the sphere of foreign relations, it also expressly, expressly provided that those powers would be conducted by the PLO on the PA's behalf. It is to be recalled that since 1988, the designation of Palestine has been used in the place of the PLO at the United Nations, and today Palestine is a non-member observer state of the UN and is recognized by 139 states, as I have mentioned. So having dealt with the international law and addressed the prevailing circumstances, I'd like now to shift to the third uh, part of, of my brief talk. What are the practical uh, implications of recognition of the state of Palestine? Um, at, in the first place, uh, the best place to begin, I imagine, is to, is to note that recognition as such is a political act, not a legal one. As a result, it's easy to hold that uh, the view that recognition is an act that offers little more than symbolic value. With respect, uh, I believe this approach would be mistaken. Once political prerogatives are exercised and, and, and an entity is recognized as a state, in, uh, 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 in fact, concrete legal consequences flow from that both on the domestic and international planes. And these legal consequences give rise to political shifts as well. I shall take each of these in turn. On the domestic plane, recognition of a foreign state triggers the application of a host of legal rights and obligations that thereafter govern the new state-to-state -state relationship. These most commonly include mutual extension of foreign sovereign immunities. They also include exchange of diplomatic envoys who benefit from a number of privileges and immunities in support of their functions in the receiving state. Diplomatic functions, of course, lead to all manner of cooperation in a wide variety of subject areas deemed to be mutually beneficial, including political, cultural, economic, security, and scientific uh, sectors, just to name a few. But perhaps most importantly, on the international plane, statehood bolsters the application of a number of international legal principles that by definition can only apply to states and which are therefore the bedrock of the modern international legal order. The first among these is the principle of the sovereign equality of states with its corollaries that the, the territory integrity and political independence of the state is inviolable and that its internal affairs are not to be interfered with save in very limited circumstances allowed under the UN Charter. While it is true that the OPT already enjoys a certain level of international protection from sovereignty claims by the occupying power, uh, this protection derives from the discrete negative proscriptions against acquisition of territory through war. Occupation is meant to be temporary. The occupying power can never be sovereign in an occupied territory. Recognition of Palestine as a state will only bolster the level of this protection in the OPT. Um, 
by affirming the positive right of Palestine as an occupied state to enjoy the right of non-interference in its domestic affairs in furtherance of its right to territory integrity, uh, territorial integrity and political independence. Because occupation is meant to be temporary, as I've mentioned, these higher order norms introduced by recognition of Palestine statehood will help the international community argue that Israel's continued presence in it is in and of itself illegal. This will in turn make it more difficult for third states to extend legitimacy to Israeli actions in the OPT that are ultimately counterproductive to peace and which, although already illegal, are often presented as residing in a gray zone. Uh, one concrete example of this is the granting of preferential access to settlement products in markets of third states with concern limited to product labeling as opposed to whether those products should actually enjoy privileged access at all. Such policies would not survive scrutiny, or at least not as easily, if the higher order framework of state-to-state -state relations was in place through recognition of the state of Palestine. Just as important, statehood bolsters the ability of the recognized state to engage in international activities that can help it redress, uh, seek redress for violations of its people's rights, and at the very least, serve as a deterrent to those who would continue such violations, thereby disrupting the prospect for peace. Membership in international organizations and multilateral treaties are the obvious examples of this. Since 29 November 2012, Palestine has acceded to over 40 multilateral treaties, including the major international human rights treaties, humanitarian law treaties and criminal law conventions, as well as treaties of a more general uh, purpose. Likewise, Palestine has become a member of a number of international organizations, including Interpol and the International Criminal Court. Palestine also has, been, uh, has, has launched proceedings in a case currently pending before the International Court of Justice. Now, the importance of recognition of Palestine statehood is underscored by the current proceedings at both the ICC and the ICJ. These judicial bodies are open only to states. Their object and purpose is broadly aimed at upholding the international rule of law, one criminal, the ICC, the other general, the ICJ. And although Palestine has properly filed cases in both of these judicial fora, Claims have been made by a number of interlocutors that they have no right to do so on the basis that Palestine is not a state. Again, only states may access these courts. In my respectful view, these claims are without merit and have been made with the sole aim, not only of limiting options available for Palestine to seek access to justice in a nonviolent way, but also for it to leverage such, op such options to encourage a positive change of behavior in the policies of the occupying power ultimately leading to conditions more amenable to peace. The best evidence of this is the great expenditure, expenditure of effort the occupying power has deployed to block Palestine's access to these judicial fora. Pacific means of dispute settlement is a foundational principle of the United Nations Charter system for a reason. Recognition of the state of Palestine can only help bolster efforts now being made in furtherance of this end. It is appropriate to conclude uh, my brief remarks by recalling the words of Dame Karen P. Pierce, the, the foreign UK permanent representative to the United Nations. In April 2019, she stated the following before the United Nations Security Council, and I quote, like other governments, the United Kingdom continues to encourage a just resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in line with international law and relevant Security Council resolutions. Our understanding, shared by most council members, continues to be that sustainable peace requires a safe and secure Israel living alongside a viable and sovereign Palestinian state based on the 1967 borders. She continues, just as we fully support and are proud of our role in the creation of the modern state of Israel as a Jewish homeland, so we fully support the objective of a viable and sovereign Palestinian state. There are two halves of the Balfour Declaration, she said, the second half of which has not been fulfilled. To that extent, it remains unfinished business." End quote. I've I've, I have today briefly attempted to explain how this unfinished business of Her Majesty's government can be fulfilled, at least in part, by extending UK recognition to the state of Palestine. From a legal perspective, such an act would add to the growing majority of the international community 
who've already extended recognition to Palestine. Further, it would politically bolster the encouraging resort to various diplomatic and judicial means of dispute resolution employed by the Palestinians, all of which must be encouraged, encouraged and aimed at forcing, and all of which is aimed at forcing a shift in the policies of the occupying power where the international community has thus far failed. On this rationale alone, the case for recognition of Palestine seems to me to be an obvious one where, when one considers the previous avenues explored. If a two-state solution is the declared goal of the international community, and because final status issues have never included the statehood of Palestine as such, it is high time for third countries, including the UK, to put their money where their mouth is on recognition of Palestine. Something else should be obvious, however. Recognition is not an end in and of itself. It would surely not in itself bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians. It would, however, serve as a holding operation of sorts. As I've, else, as I've noted, the historical record is very clear. Any and all measures must be taken to halt the ongoing colonization by the occupying power of the OPT. If this colonization continues unencumbered, it will end any notion of the two-state vision of which Dane Pierce so long, longingly spoke. In its place will be crystallized a single apartheid state in which continued conflict and bloodshed will almost certainly prevail. Having done away with the last vestiges of collective Palestinian national rights, including to peoplehood, self-determination, sovereignty, and political independence, the occupying power will be left unchecked to pursue its goal of conquering the whole of Mandate Palestine once and for all. In this reality, in which the indigenous Palestinians will be subsumed as an internal affair in Israel, and therefore effectively beyond the reach of the international community, it will be even more difficult than it is now for third states to compel Israel to respect its international legal obligations and ultimately to arrive at a peaceful resolution of the conflict for both Israelis and Palestinians in line with international law. With that, I would like uh, to say thank you. That, that concludes my remarks. And, and I would like to invite uh, questions from, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Ardi. That was so fascinating. Um, and obviously with your background working with the UN on this issue, um, there really isn't a better person to talk uh, to us about this. So we've had loads of questions coming in. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that as always, we we'll be putting the um, recordings, audio and visual recordings, and the transcript eventually, um, that takes us a little bit longer, on the website in the past events section. So um, if you want to check that out, um, if you want to share that, then please do have a look at our website. Um, I will also be posting the links to the publications that um, RD shared with us that I put in the chat. Um, so that will all be available on the website as soon as possible. Um, so questions that have come in. Um, the first one <coughs> comes from one of your um, uh, one of your fellow Canadians. His name is Michael Dan. He's a former neurosurgeon who uh, created the Paloma Foundation, which works with the um, marginalized people in the Toronto area. And he's a um, friend of the Balfour Project. He says, given that it's been over eight decades since the international community first proposed a two-state solution for Palestine, and notwithstanding three major attempts to bring one about, it still hasn't materialized. Is there any sort of one-state solution that you think the Palestinian people would or should be willing to accept? Incidentally, I would ask the same question to the Jewish people who at present make up only 50% of the people living between the river and the sea. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. That's, that's an extremely important question. It's on the minds clearly of, of many uh, onlookers uh, uh, who are students and, and concerned with, with Israel, Palestine. Um, it's of note uh, to recall because the question I think focuses on what the Palestinians would accept um, or whether or not it could be acceptable a one state solution to Palestinians. I, I of course don't speak on behalf of the Palestinian people or any people as such, I only speak on behalf of myself. At any rate, it's important to recall that uh, the original position of the indigenous Palestinian Arab people of Palestine was that Palestine as a whole in 1947, when it was before the United Nations General Assembly, 
should not be partitioned against the express wishes of the majority of its population than two thirds the majority of the Palestinian Arab population were and should experience uh, uh, the benefits of independence in the whole, uh, including the Jewish population who, 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 were, who lived there and a democratic uh, one single state should exist. And they struggled for this end, uh, the PLO did for decades um, and struggled against the grain. And uh, so difficult was that struggle that by 1988, when the PLO took a strategic decision to engage in what it called the historic historic compromise, if you like, um, to recognize Israel in 78% of mandate Palestine in favor of the establishment of a Palestinian state in the remaining 22% being the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip, um, that doors began to open for the Palestinians, that the international community began to press uh, hard for uh, ostensibly for a two-state solution and so, and so forth. In view of this, um, the inability of the parties to reach a two-state solution largely, in my respectful view, through the, the violations of international law undertaken by, by the occupying power over its 53-year temporary occupation, it's very clearly intending on remaining in the territory uh, and asserting its sovereignty there. Um, people are now talking about a one-state reality. And I don't think you would have a hard time convincing Palestinians of the usefulness of that and the, the idealism behind it. I, I think the idea of democracy, one person, one vote is a very important thing and, 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 and useful. I think the real problem, the sticking point would be for the Zionist uh, colleagues on the other side who still view uh, as important the need for a Jewish state. I quote Benny Morris here in 1948 and after Oxford University Press sometime in the early 2000s. How, and the fundamental question for the Zionist movement is how do you establish it and maintain a Jewish state in a place full of non-Jews? You necessarily have to deal with that demographic reality, you know, which is why we have the Palestine refugee problem, why the ethnic cleansing took place in 1947 and so forth. So the only way you'll have a one state, real, one state solution where people are actually free, Jew, Palestinian, Christian, Muslim, et cetera, uh, Israeli, are if you relinquish any notion of exclusivity uh, of one over the other in that land, the, the burden on that question falls definitely to the Israeli side, not the Palestinian side. They, they've long desired a democratic state in, in the country. And in fact, the two state uh, solution is, is their attempt to, um, to my, in my reading, to, to uh, maintain, to gain some modicum of, of rights and establish some modicum of rights in a world that has been horribly cruel uh, uh, in respect of their situation. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we've, the next question is an interesting one from Heather Formaney. Um, the que question which I feel needs to be addressed is whether the Balfour Declaration can be challenged legally retrospectively. No, you touched on it a little bit in your talk. Yeah, that, I've had that question put to me before. Um, one has to ask, the, you begin with the first question, was the Balfour Declaration a legal instrument? See Thomas and Sally Mallison on that question. They did wonderful work in the 1980s on it. Uh, there, are de there are debates about that. Um, what is, I think, more important um, and really gives one a critique or invites a critique of public international law as a tool of subjugation. And I write about this in a book that I'm doing now on the United Nations and the question of Palestine, is the fact that the terms of the Balfour Declaration were actually incorporated by, uh, by the League of Nations into an international uh, convention, if you like, the, the, um, the mandate for Palestine. And the moment that that happened in 1922-23, is the moment that legal rights are given to a settler colonial movement, the Zionist movement, in international law, rights to settle the territory, uh, right to establish a Jewish homeland, and eventually a state, um, to the detriment of the indigenous people of Palestine, being the Palestinian Arabs. Um, can you challenge it? You might be able to do so academically. Can you do so effectively and legally today? That would all, that would all turn on what relevant jurisdiction you, you try and challenge it under, British jurisdiction, Palestinian jurisdiction, I think it would be very, very difficult to do so. Um, 
you can write a whole book on this question and I, and I don't think I have the time here to, to answer that. Please feel free to email me though at Queen's University for a fuller examination of the point. Thanks again for that. Um, we've got so many interesting questions coming in. So I'm um, gonna good. try to get through as many as possible. Sorry if we don't get around to everyone's questions. Um, from Peter Buckley, how do you see the new US administration affecting the situation? Um, good question uh, on everybody's minds. Um, the pendulum has swung so far to the right with uh, Trump's moves to, among other things, recognize the legality of Israel's um, settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, recognize Israel's sovereignty in Jerusalem, recognize its sovereignty in occupied Syria, the Golan Heights, um, to attack UNRWA, uh, the very existence of, of Palestine refugees as a category in law. It has swung so far to the right by the Trump administration that I do think that the Biden administration in the best of times is gonna have a hard time swinging it back somewhere in the center. Uh, in discussions that I've had with members of the State Department, I understand that the United States will likely um, uh, uh, begin, uh, 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 begin funding UNRWA again. To what extent, we do not know. We don't know if it will be a return to previous funding of UNRWA but it will likely happen. Uh, but Biden will not be able to say, remove the United States uh, decision on Jerusalem uh, uh, and may not be willing to deal with the settlement issue at, at state. Um, looking uh, historically, let's recall, Joe Biden is uh, a vowed friend, a supporter. The historical record there is very, very clear of Israel. Um, Israel is a bipartisan issue in the United States. So the short answer to the question is, uh, at best, it'll be a return to the Obama type era, uh, plus, uh, plus a bit more to the right of what Trump is, has, has done. So um, the US will not be able in any real sense to perform an honest broker role and it won't even attempt to try, I think, openly to do so. Uh, yeah, unfortunately that's, that's where we are with the US. Right, well, that's quite depressing, isn't it? Um, I've got a question from Vincent Seen, who, um, as you all know, is our chair of um, the Balfour Project trustees. Um, he asks, where does RD think the Palestinian call for the ICC to examine alleged Israeli breaches of international law will go? Is law fair, a fair description of this, and is it valid? Um. That's two questions. So uh, let me just jot down both of them. Uh, I'll answer the first. Where do I think the ICC matter will go? Well, I mean, just to, to put the, the listeners up to speed, uh, uh, there are four, generally four stages in any ICC uh, matter. You begin with a preliminary examination by the Office of the Prosecutor. It then moves to an investigation by the Office of the Prosecutor. And then uh, it then from there moves to charges that are held or that are uh, issued with a trial, possibly an appeal, a fourth level. And that, that's, the, that's the process that would, that would go, um, that, would, that would be undertaken. Uh, in December, 2019, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court completed her preliminary examination, indicating that in her view, there was enough evidence to, to launch a formal investigation. Um, and before she launches that formal investigation, she has sought a ruling of the pretrial chamber uh, of the court for uh, an answer to a discrete question on the scope of the territorial application of the Rome statute, the, the governing statute of, of, of the criminal court, the International Criminal Court. She basically believes that the scope of the territorial application of this treaty, and therefore the scope of her investigation, territorially speaking, is the occupied Palestinian territory. She anticipates that in the future, during trial, for instance, that would be um, challenged by interlocutors and so has taken a decision to um, get ahead of the game and seek a ruling from the pretrial chamber on that. The pretrial chamber has yet to rule on the matter. Uh, I've written on the matter and Deanna will share, uh, uh, share uh, an article with you on that. My view is that if I, tend not to sort of bet on how courts are going to rule. It's very difficult, but on balance, I think it's logical to believe that the court will rule that the, the territorial scope is the occupied Palestinian territory. And then 
that will uh, open the way for an investigation. Mind you, uh, the court does not need uh, to approve the OPT opening an investigation uh, for a number of reasons. She's free to do that, uh, the prosecutor. Um, you mentioned lawfare. I, I actually don't like that, that term. It's a rather balmy term. Uh, it is the use of law. Uh, historically, law has been used by all manner of different groups, uh, domestically and internationally, to seek redress for wrongs. Um, to call it lawfare is to suggest that somehow the legitimacy of the use of law as a means to seek redress for wrongs is somehow questioned uh, and questionable. Um, you either have a good case or you don't. Make your case. Um, so... I, I see no problem at all with, with Palestine or any other party uh, using uh, law and legal remedies and, and redress if they can make their case. Thanks for that. Um, so we've got a question from Maggie Foyer. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I think that it came in when you were talking about um, criteria for statehood and you were talking about having legal structures and so forth and government and... Um, and so forth. Um, she, she, she asks, um, thank you for setting out the legal situation with such clarity. Um, sadly, the reality on the ground in the OPT is a total breakdown of law with settlers rampaging at will. What can be done to protect Palestinian civilians? A good question and one that has long been on, on, on many of our radars. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, under international law, uh, specifically the law of belligerent occupation, the occupying power, in this case Israel, has an obligation to protect the protected population. That is a term of art, the protected population. See Article 4 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And the protected population are the Palestinian civilian population of the OPT. And despite the obligation to protect, the occupying power has quite, quite the opposite, undertaken a series of policy measures over the course of 53 years to violate the rights of this population. So there is clearly an unwillingness on the part of the primary party who has that obligation, the occupying power, to protect. Um, the Palestinian side, the local side, uh, has very little ability to protect its population from the ravages of the violations being wrought on, on it by the occupying power. And indeed, to be sure, the, uh, the uh, local Palestinian authority sometimes itself is engaged in human rights violations against uh, the Palestinian people, freedom of speech, freedom of association issues, all kinds of human rights problems have arisen in occupied Palestine or the portions that are under the authority of the Palestinian authority, which again uh, affirms the importance of, of the fact that Palestine did accede to the human rights treaties because that means they, they care. Uh, ostensibly so to, to be a responsible member of the international community and ensure their own obligations under human rights law. But in the absence of an ability of the, the Israeli side and the local Palestinian side to, to protect Palestinian civilians from the ravages and the violations of their rights, it must fall necessarily to third states. And so um, uh, third states, the rest of the international community, as I said in my, in my talk, have obligations, clear obligations under international human rights and humanitarian law to ensure respect for that law. Uh, so they not only have the right to, to respect themselves that law, but to ensure its respect by other parties. Uh, see Article 1 of the Fourth Geneva Convention as an example of what is meant. What might some of this look like? Mm, third states have the obligation to ensure that war crimes, crimes against humanity um, are prosecuted uh, domestically, right? Uh, so to the extent that a third state like the United Kingdom might invite settlement products into its territory, that actually runs completely contrary to the United Kingdom's obligations under international humanitarian law to ensure respect for that body of law, because that body of law renders, makes it very clear that settlements are illegal, they are a war crime, under international criminal law, individual criminal responsibility should flow from, can flow from the establishment of settlements. Why ever would a third state be encouraging those things? And so there are many, many ways to protect. Um, the only question is, is there the requisite political will to press uh, these legal buttons, if you like, and obligations of third states in third state uh, domestic uh, fora? There's also international fora. We've talked about the ICJ, the ICC. There's a whole host of these things. I've written quite a bit on that, so I won't take, a, take up too much time but you're welcome to, to consult, consult that uh, and other writings. 
Well, as I um, mentioned, I um, will be posting, I've posted the links to those recent publications um, on our website and they will appear in past events along with the recordings of this talk and the transcripts as well. Many of you have been asking for that. Um, so the next question from Johnny Riff, um, what impact do you think the recognition of the state of Palestine would have on the right of return of Palestinian refugees, given that many of those rights apply within Israel itself, rather than the territory of the new Palestinian state? Yeah, when I was a legal advisor uh, at UNRWA for many years, we actually considered this very closely. Uh, I'm not now offering an UNRWA view, I'm offering my own view. Um, it would have no impact whatever. The right of Palestine refugees to return uh, to their homes and properties is established as a matter of both, uh, uh, as a matter of custom, customary international law and affirmed by the General Assembly annually, as you know, in Resolution 194. Um, the territorial scope where they may end up returning is not circumscribed by law uh, to be limited only to the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. Uh, there's a lot of political talk around that question and fears are, uh, I think, unduly raised that in the event of a Palestinian state emerging in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including uh, East Jerusalem, that the Palestinian right to return would only be able to be affected <clears throat> within that state. And therefore, there would be a limitation uh, on the rights of Palestine refugees to return to their original lands, their original homes, et cetera that does not at all hold water at all as a matter of law. Uh, again, the right to return exists as both an individual right and a collective one, and Israel is under, under an obligation not to denationalize a population, which it did, and states may never denationalize populations en masse, and on the basis of immutable characteristics, such as skin color, religion, race, etc., cetera, um, and not allow them to return. So I would not worry about that from a legal perspective. From a political perspective, it's wholly another matter. And the parties, of course, have yet to agree uh, uh, an, uh, a just and agreed resolution to the Palestine refugee problem. And it is not <clears throat> outside of the realm of the possible that, uh, that the parties may agree that that right be recognized by the Israeli side, morally compensation be paid, but that the actual physical return only be allowed to a truncated Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. That's just one scenario, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the only one. International law would not uh, 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 admit of such a, a, a circumstance. Thanks for that answer. Um, there's a question on COVID, which um, is not directly related to the topic, but it was just really interesting. So if you've got any insight on it, um, I would be interested anyway. Um, this is from Bettina Marks. Can you comment on the obligation or not of Israel to provide the Palestinians in the occupied territory with the vaccine against COVID-19? Does the fact that there is a Palestinian government absolve Israel from its duties as an occupier? Yeah, it's a very good question. The answer is no, it doesn't absolve Israel from its duties as an occupying power in this regard. Uh, I would refer you to article 59, if my recollection serves, of the Fourth Geneva Convention um, and Article 60, if again, if my recollection serves of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Article 59 requires, yes, I think it's Article 59. I could reach over to the convention and pick it out, but at any rate, uh, the occupying power is under an obligation to facilitate relief schemes uh, for the protected population if it is not supplied in the way that it needs to be supplied from a humanitarian perspective. These, this reference to relief schemes includes supply of medicines, medical aid, uh, and others, uh, other such uh, uh, help and assistance. Um, Article 60 makes it clear that to the extent that an occupying power uh, engages in agreements with others to provide such su uh, support, uh, such relief, um, no such agreement can absolve the occupying power of its principal responsibility in this, re in this respect. So there's no question that as a matter of the law of belligerent occupation uh, as applied to Israel as an occupying power, it has an obligation to ensure that the Palestinian population of the whole of the occupied Palestinian territory receives vaccinations and in a timely way uh, to COVID-19. 
for against COVID-19. But leave aside the law. I mean, it seems to me to be monumentally stupid not to do so, just given the you know, the close proximity with, with, within which Palestinians and Israelis live, whether settlers or Israeli nationals in Israel proper, or et cetera. Um, it seems to me to be stupid just based on what we know about the, you know, how, how COVID-19 is, 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 uh, shifts from, from population to population. Uh, so there you have the law. See Article 59 and 60 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And if I've mistakenly uh, set those articles out, it might possibly be in the 50s, but it's certainly there. That's really interesting. Yeah, it seems to make sense. Um, and it seems like it would be shooting themselves in the foot, not yeah. getting on that. So um, we've got a question from Andrew Whitley, who's one of our trustees. Um, he says, based on your excellent presentation, I would conclude that while UK recognition of Palestine is desirable, it is unlikely to be decisive in terms of shifting the political balance between the parties, unless accompanied by a package of other concrete measures that will impact Israel's calculations. Additionally, the UK should act in concert with other major states, um, especially France as another P5 member. Do you agree with my reasoning? Uh, it's good to hear from you, Andrew. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, not wholly. Uh, I agree with you that <clears throat> recognition itself is not going to fundamentally alter things on its own. That is the recognition of one country of another, um, just given how many countries we're dealing with in the world. However, the United Kingdom is a, is a member of the P5, uh, notwithstanding the fact that its days of empire are long over, it still has political clout. There is a clout, th there is a legitimacy therefore uh, that might become contagious uh, if, the United, if the United Kingdom recognizes the state of Palestine, it'll make it easier for other states, other major powers to do so as well. France, you've mentioned one, um, and other members in Western Europe. Uh, recognition, if you look at state practice on recognition of states, particularly in UN admissions practice, uh, often looks like a domino effect, right? Big country, one big country does it, and then a, other, a group of others follow. And so there is value added there. Uh, but I don't disagree with you that recognition is not in and of itself the answer. It would necessarily need more, ideally need to be accompanied by a package of other measures. And one can, you know, the sky's the limit on what kind of measures that might look like from a diplomatic standpoint. Um, again, state to state relations cover all manner of sectors in, in human engagement with one another. And uh, there could be mutually beneficial uh, relations between Palestine and even greater mutually beneficial relations between Palestine and the United Kingdom, and that don't come at a cost to uh, Palestine, rather the United Kingdom's good relations with Israel. Um, you know, there's been talk, for instance, about Palestine uh, becoming a member of the Commonwealth, right? Uh, given the historical connection of the British and Palestine and all of that. So there's all manner of different uh, packages of uh, different elements of a package that should go along with it. But, uh, but I wouldn't wholly say that the UK should wait for the French and the French should wait for the UK that, you know, 139 states recognize the state of Palestine. Uh, there are only 193 or four uh, or five states in the world. The time to act is now. Well, um, I just have to thank you. Um, RD for just such a fascinating talk. Um, I know everyone um, in the chat has thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's been very lively. Um, I haven't been able to get through all the questions. There were so many. Um, I will be sharing all the comments and everything with RD so he will see your comments and your questions and so forth. Um, so I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone who's come along and attended and on behalf of the Balfour Project and um, and like I said, we'll be putting the recording on the website shortly so you can share, rewatch, and so forth. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thank Bye. you. Take good care. <laughs>